We often hear the story of Daniel. It's one of our favorites in Scripture. It's one of the ones told most often. And it's a remarkable story in that it takes place over a 70-year period at least. Uh, four, four kings, three kingdoms, depending on how you look at it. If you consider the Medes and the Persians one kingdom, then two. But he served a long time. Daniel starts out as a young aristocrat in Judah. He's part of the royalty there, uh, David's line, the line of Judah. And he is taken captive along with uh, many in Judah. The king had a wise sort of policy. He killed those he needed to kill. He left those he needed to leave. And he took everybody else who might be of advantage to him or service to him in his court. So Nebuchadnezzar was the uh, king that attacked Judah, some of you might recall, and it was his son Nebuchadnezzar that actually reigned in Babylon immediately thereafter and worked with these captives that were taken there. Now you can imagine we have focused in our, our children's stories of what would it be like to be a young man who is now a prisoner of war taken to a strange place and so forth. And in our story, when we talk about Daniel from an Adventist point of view, we historically have emphasized that he would not be defiled with the king's food, rich food, the meats and the wines. And we've made it a sort of vegetarian thing. Uh, Daniel and his companions were not strictly vegetarian. They, of course, ate lamb and other things. But in the context of the court, meat had been offered to idols, to false gods, and was therefore defiled, along with the wines. And so they preferred a simple diet. That would be the take-home. And I didn't include those portions in our reading today because I don't want to emphasize that. This is a story of a graduate, of an academic who made something of himself. You see, Daniel was taken to a foreign land, and it was the expectation that as royalty, being young as he was, looking as he did, and they inspected them head to toe. There was a physical. We, we, aren't, we, we aren't used to hearing it in these terms. But the military and political machine of Babylon had an intake process. They were given a physical. They were evaluated. They were questioned by the military and by specific leadership, and they were taken to be trained and to be studied and, and to be given studies. So they arrive in Babylon and they're set into a university course that's three years long. They were to learn everything, all of the knowledge of Babylon. It was quite a bit of knowledge. They learned some mathematics, they learned some astronomy. I know you won't uh, agree with this, I won't either, but they learned astrology. They learned soothsaying of every kind according to the ways of the Babylonians. They were trained in all types of religion and literature. They were trained in the language of the Chaldeans, as the Bible says. At the end of these three years, they were to be tested, which they were, because in part, of their heritage and their diet and their God and their choices, Daniel and his three friends are found to be ten times better equipped for service than any others of the young men taken from Judah or elsewhere in the world. We're talking about a world empire. We're talking about a king who had great ambitions, who saw himself, indeed, as we get to chapter 2 in Daniel, as an image of pure gold not just a head of gold. Daniel would go on to serve along with his friends in distinction. He would save the lives of many in Babylon. He would preserve in the mind of the king a place for the God of Israel, Jehovah the Mighty One. On more than one occasion, Nebuchadnezzar would be forced to say, there is no higher God. On a number of occasions, Nebuchadnezzar would be forced to say, well, he wouldn't be forced to, but he would choose to say, if anybody speaks, so much as speaks against the God of Israel, against the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I will cut him to pieces. 
was a different era. You could lose your head for just the craziest things. Absolute dictators rule absolutely, and kings were absolute dictators. But it is in this context we find one of the few mentions of a graduation in Scripture. I bring this because I want us to take from this story a number of things, but primarily today I want to take from it the power of learning. We often in the st story of Daniel rightly emphasize Daniel's humility, his constant faithfulness to the God of Israel, his service of that God, and his constant reminding everyone else that only God can do certain things. When Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and forgets the dream and wants not only the interpretation of the dream but the dream itself, Daniel's very quick to say no human can do this. Daniel's very quick to acknowledge that only God can, can reconstruct somebody's dream for them. Only God can, can give them an interpretation of such a dream. And as you recall, it's prayer and fasting that bring Daniel to a reception of that same dream that Nebuchadnezzar gets and an explanation of it, the dream of the king made of different kinds of metals, head of gold, chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay, and the stone cut out without hands that destroys it and turns it to dust. It is that dream and its interpretation that God gives to Daniel. But Daniel can't be there to speak to the king. Daniel couldn't have been in that place at that time doing what he did unless he had received the education. He could not have been where he was and done what he did without mastery of those things that were important for him to learn in the context in which he learned them. His leadership was based and founded upon his willingness and ability to learn. He was humble enough to be teachable, and he was open enough to serve well, even though this was a Gentile king. So those are some things I want to take this morning from that story. I want us to remember in this time of graduations and recognition and leadership and fatherhood, I want us to remember that learning is a constant. It's a necessity. It's part of what helps makes, make us wise and makes us strong. It's part of what allows us to be in jobs or in places where the decisions we make or the things we say may have sway, where our influence may be the most profound, where you and I can make a difference for the kingdom of God. One of the things I love about the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that we believe in education. Now, I think there are Seventh-day Adventists that actually say they believe in education, but fear it. How do I put this more succinctly? I think there are those who think that when we get to higher education and we teach it, that we actually teach our children things that draw them out of faith rather than into faith. And I would like to suggest to you that the world is a hard place with many options and many paradigms. And if we don't teach our children what is being taught, if we don't teach them how to think, if we haven't given them a foundation in Christ and a foundation in learning, how shall they live in the world as Christians? It takes a lot these days. And so I would just encourage our people to rejoice in what the Seventh-day Adventist Church has developed, has developed in the way of an educational emphasis and system, and to continue to support higher education in its goals of helping our young people not only know the world of thought in which they live, but to be able to address it critically. It's vitally important. It's part of a whole group of people who will one day, hopefully, lead. We have a couple of other texts I just thought were worth your time today as we 
think about the scriptures in this question of learning and leadership. Job 34 was read to us very nicely just a few minutes ago. Hear my words, you wise men. Listen to me, men of learning. The ear tests words. What we hear, we evaluate, just as the tongue tastes foods. So let us discern for ourselves what is right and let us learn together what is good. That's the wisdom of Job. It doesn't need a lot of exegesis. I don't have to flesh this out for you too much. You're a very intelligent bunch. You hear what he is saying. We test words for truth. We discern for ourselves what is right. And we learn together what is good. And in that context, two things, two gifts develop in us. Knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom. Listed as gifts of the Holy Spirit. For the blessing and equipping of the church for the edification of the body, and ultimately to place us in positions where we can lead. I know what you're thinking. Well, I don't need to learn to lead. I don't want to lead. Maybe leadership per se isn't going to be your gift. But God has called us to be a nation of kings and priests, a priestly nation. Does that make sense? You are set apart and called. It isn't just a pastor who leads a church. It takes dozens of leaders in a church to make it what it is. It takes dozens of people with expertise, with opinions, with knowledge, with wisdom, with perspective, with grit. It takes all of these coming together and lots of people willing to work with them to make a church. Some of you missed the announcement earlier in the service about camp meeting in July right here. There's going to be a chance for every one of you to be involved in service, to be involved in testimony, to be involved in song, to be involved in something in that time. It takes a body, a church, and knowledge and wisdom and learning equip us for the journey. The gospel text is where I want to end up because it helps us with a little insight that's profound. Jesus is outlining the path to the Father. You remember other dialogues in Scripture where Philip is concerned, show us the Father, he says to Jesus. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Philip. And Philip still doesn't get it and says, so, okay, show us the Father. And Jesus says, how long have you been with me? I and my Father are one. Here he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up in the last day. It's written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Now last I checked, all was an inclusive word. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be taught by God. It doesn't mean that just the elders of this church are going to be taught by God, or the elders and perhaps the deacons or the Sabbath school teachers, and no, they shall. Thank you. It's not a hard word. All be taught by God. Everyone. God is your teacher. Learning is the object. Leadership is the outcome. Now, there's more to it. Not much, but much to be said. Everyone who's heard the Father and learned from Him comes to me. But no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. So, it's one of these situations where we learn from the Father, but we don't see the Father, but we see the Son. And if we want to learn who the Father is, we can learn that from the Son directly, can we not? 
So when we get to a gospel teaching, when we get to the learning that Jesus is describing, it's a matter of you and I sitting at the feet of Jesus. How does that happen? It's not a mystery. You take his words and make them your own. You take his grace and begin to let it move and work in your heart. You seek his wisdom and you begin to reflect it. You take his teachings and you begin to let them sink deep into the soil of your soul where they will sprout and produce fruit. You listen to his words where he says, if you love me, obey me and keep my commands. And you begin the process in humility of doing what he tells you to do, even when it doesn't necessarily make sense to you at the time. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom. Learning. Knowledge. Leadership. I'm not even asking you to learn to soothsay or to read a liver or a palm or to know astrology or something else you would disagree with and I would disagree with. Like Daniel had to learn. I'm asking you to learn of the one true God who makes himself known in the person of Jesus Christ. And in knowing him, being able to serve him and being able to lead in the world in which he places you. For as Daniel said, you never know when you'll be called to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm going to ask our deacons to please step forward and be prepared to collect our offering today. Freely we have received, freely let us give in support of the tithes of this church and the offerings. Thank you.